talks have resumed in Hawler between the Rojava People's Assembly and the Syrian Kurdish National Council after a long interval. The subjects discussed on the first day included joint attendance at Geneva II, the traditional administration proclaimed in Rojava, the opening of the Sumelka border crossing, the release of certain detainees, mainly members of El Party and Party Azadi, and the investigation of certain incidents. At the end of 16-hour session, the two sides reached agreements on the subjects of the two assemblies attending Geneva II together. But there was still no compromise was made on other contentious issues by two sides. In addition, if an independent delegation cannot be accepted by international powers, Kurds will go to Geneva II as a part of the Syrian opposition. It was also agreed to establish a commission to examine certain incidents that have taken place in Rojava. It is reported that the opening of the Sumelka border crossing on one of the most important issues between South Kurdistan and Rojava was also discussed and agreed to open the border. Rojava People's Assembly and the Federal Kurdistan Regional Authorities have reached on the activate of Kurdish Supreme Council as soon as possible. Another subject was the participation of the Syrian Kurdish National Council to the Democratic Self-Rule Administration in Rojava. But the sides did not compromise over this subject. Diyarbakir's Sixth High Criminal Court has unanimously rejected a demand for the release of three jailed deputies of the Peace and Democracy Party, Kemal Aktash, Selma Irmak and Faisal Yildiz, who are tried in the scope of the so-called KGK case. The court decision came after Diyarbakir Fifth High Criminal Court also rejected prosecutors' demand for the release of BDP deputies Ibrahim Ayhan and Gülser Yildirim. Imprisoned Kurdish deputies Selma Irmak, Yusser Yildirim, Faisal Sarı Yıldız, Ibrahim Ayhan and Kemal Aktaş have issued a joint statement saying the blow inflicted on the rule of law by the specially authorized courts on 16th of December in Diyarbakir was also designed to sabotage the process of resolution. We would like our people to know that we will carry on our struggle. Deputies remarked that the alliance of the AKP government and the Fethullah Gülen movement has updated this mentally since 2009, embarking on a massive campaign of arrests, terrorizing the democratic political struggle, filling the prisons with thousands of activists who are now being tried and given incredible sentences for carrying on legitimate activities. Deputies called on political authorities to take responsibility and put an end to this illegality and double standard. We also want to make clear that we will never accept this situation and maintain our struggle against it, they added. Deputies said specially authorized courts must be abolished immediately if peace is required in Turkey and invited judicial circles to take a stand against this legal scandal, which, they said, is a black stain on the political life of Turkey and threatens social peace. On the other hand, Kurdish deputies from People's Democratic Party, Peace and Democracy Party, spent the night at the Parliament Hall within a hunger strike to protest the recent rejection of release requests for jailed deputies. The hunger strike initiated by deputies Sebahat Tuncel, Ertuğrul Kürkçü, Levent Tüzel, Sırı Süreya Önder, Demir Çelik and Özdal Uçer turned its day to. There has been an ongoing conflict since a while between AKP and Gülen movement concerning the appointments in the police force, the attempt to investigate Hakan Fidan, head of National Intelligence Service, assignments of prosecutors and lastly the attempt to legally eliminate the private prep schools. The conflict has turned into an open battle by the operation in which children of three ministers have been detained on Tuesday morning. Among the detained are Mustafa Demir, the mayor of Fatih municipality in Istanbul, Reza Zerab, a businessman with Iranian roots, the sons of the ministers of interior affairs, of economy and of environment and urbanization, in addition to Suleyman Aslan, the CEO of Halkbank. The operation is allegedly carried out by police and prosecutors connected to Gülen movement, while the information is allegedly provided by NSA. The first reaction of the government to the operation has been the discharge totally for the six police officers in different cities till now and appointing of additional prosecutors to the case. 
According to the information from the police source, based on a tip from an informant whose initials are reported to be AM, finance ministry inspectors examined the activities and accounts of three fictitious companies established in Turkey and found that they were used to receive large sums of money transferred from Iran. Documents and testimony provided by this informant indicated that the amount of money laundered through transmissions to these companies' accounts reached a staggering 87 billion euros between 2009 and 2012, mainly through Bank Mellad, 40% of which is owned by Iran. The beginning of the operation against the money laundering scheme dates back to December 14, 2011, when three Azerbaijanis and an Iranian were caught with 40.5 million dollars and 4 million euros in cash in their cases in Russia's Vnukovo airport. The Russian Federal Customs Bureau reported the names of the couriers and demanded that the relevant money transfers be investigated. Consequently, 14 people, including the owner of a currency exchange office and his employees, were detained and they were later proven after questioning to have carried a total 40 million dollars and 10 million euros in a total of 37 trips to Russia. As the investigations deepened, four core ministers of government also inside of this bribery and money laundering relations with their network inside Turkey. Commenting on the present situation, Selahattin Demirtas, co-president of BDP, was very clear. He said that, we support this operation. Any theory or corruption must properly be investigated, no matter to whom it points. Leaving aside the political aspect of the operation, the claims must truly be examined. We will not allow any type of cover-up. A commission in the parliament to investigate the claims must be settled immediately. This reveals only the top of the iceberg. The UN World Food Programme, the United Nations Refugee Agency and UNICEF have started airlifting urgently needed humanitarian aid from Erbil to Kamishle in Rojava, known as Northeast Syria, as displaced families start to face one of the harshest winters ever as winter storm Alexa dumped large amounts of snow and brought icy temperatures to the region. The first WFP chartered flight landed on Sunday at Kamishlu Airport from Erbil with almost 40 metric tons of food, including wet flour, pasta, oil, sugar, salt, rice, canned beans and bulgur wet. Over the next few days, WFP plans to use 11 more airlifts to move enough food to feed over 30,000 people for one month. Turkey closed their air zone flights to Rojava because of embargo. Two planes are contracted to do 23 rotations until 25th of December between the two countries. It is the first humanitarian airlift of supplies from South Kurdistan, known as Northern Iraq, into West Kurdistan, known as North Syria, since the crisis in Syria erupted in March 2011. The UN Refugee Agency plans to send some 300 metric tons of urgently needed relief items to Kamishle on 12 flights from its regional stockpile in Erbil using a chartered Ilyushin IL-76. The UNHCR's aid is intended to help some 60,000 displaced people and includes 50,000 blankets, 10,000 kitchen sets, 10,000 plastic sheets, 10,000 jerry cans, 30,000 sleeping mats and 10,000 hygiene kits, among other supplies. UNICEF is sending a plane load of health kits, water and sanitation supplies to the displaced in northeast Rojava. The supplies are desperately needed in hard-to-reach areas where some 188,000 displaced people live under extremely difficult conditions in one of Syria's coldest regions. UNHCR teams based in al Hasake and Kamishle will help distribute the organization's aid. From yesterday, aid was already distributed in some areas by voluntary workers. Where Syrian refugees are, 838,000 in Lebanon, 567,000 in Jordan, 540,000 in Turkey, 207,000 in Iraq, 129,000 in Egypt, 6.5 million others displaced inside Syria.
Al-Qaeda linked Salafist terror groups have kidnapped approximately 300 Kurdish civilians since 4th of November from villages in Aleppo, Aziz, and Jaraplus province, said the Syrian Observatory for Human Rights and Anha News Agency, citing their sources. The recently kidnapped civilians are from the villages of Tilbalat, Ehreze, Khair Kalbin, Sonbat, Jobambek, Karakoz, and Kiddish. The incident is the latest in the armed conflict between Kurdish and Salafist terror factions. The Syrian Observatory reported that recently 170 Kurdish civilians from the towns of Manbij and Jarablus, northeast of Aleppo, 20 people from Qayr Kalebin village, 15 civilians from Tilbetel village and 30 civilians from Kedrish village have been kidnapped. Around 70 of them have been released but 100 of them still remain in ISIS jail in Azaz. The ISIS fighters evicted 15 Kurdish families from their houses in Talaibiyat city in Idlib province at the beginning of December, activists told the observatory. They claimed that the families were accused of supporting the Kurdish Democratic Union Party, PYD. The escalating tensions between Salafist terror groups and the Kurdish forces, YPG, guerrillas, increased after the Tilkocher border was captured by YPG forces. After that, Salafist terror groups tried many times to attack Kurdish villages, including Efring, Aleppo, Hasake and Kamishli, and in some regions have forced a large number of civilian Kurds to leave their homes. YPG forces intensify their operations in the Hasake region and around Kamishli. After many were defeated in different regions, Salafists have started kidnapping civilians as human shields. Terror groups related to Al-Qaeda are trying to destabilize the Kurdish area and force the Kurdish people out from the mixed area and to replace the population with their own people. Al-Qaeda-linked terror groups often attack Kurdish territory located along the Turkey-Iraq border, seeking to take control of the area and create an Islamic Emirate. But Kurds, with their own armed forces, YPG, vehemently resisted all kinds of terrorist attacks. As you may remember, the Rojava revolution began in 19th of July 2012. Since that day, Kurdish people fight for the imported mercenary that now covet their lands, and as well as that, they are implementing a new administrative framework in Rojava in order to develop a system of common life for all the people of the region. The Rojava revolution, which everyone of conscious and moral character supports, holds a different place for mothers. Mothers of the PKK Kurdistan Workers' Party fighters killed in the past consider the Rojava revolution their own revolution, saying Rojava is the legacy of our children. The mothers express their feeling to reporters, saying, that is the legacy that comes down from our children. We must raise it as a child born free and called on everyone to take ownership of the revolution. Zeli Hauskan, who is 55 years old and who has lost three children in the ranks of the PKK, are always with the youth of the YPG, who are fighting with the mercenary just on the other side of the artificial border. Zeli Hauskan said the following words about Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Why is Erdogan, who cried over the rapier in Egypt, remaining silent about the massacre in Rojava? Why isn't he crying for the children over here? On the contrary, he's helping mercenary over there. Let him stop this hypocrisy. God willing, our children will succeed in carrying the Rojava revolution out completely and accomplish a great deed of our people. Zainab Al, 64 years of age, is another mother who lost her son in the rank of the PKK. Zainab strongly condemned the mercenary who were attacking Kurdish gains and told the reporters that what is happening there is our children's legacy for us. We must take ownership of it and raise it up as a free child. God willing, those gangs will be driven out. Us Kurds have always been deceived, but we will not be deceived now. All Kurds need to take ownership of the revolution in Rojava. We must support them. Fatma Akbash, whose son Abdul Razak Akbash died in the PKK, offered her condolences to PYD co-president Salih Muslim and his family. 
Muslim's son Sharvan Muslim was killed fighting the mercenaries in the rank of the YPG. His martyry of the martyr of Orkha, said Akbash. I am also the mother of the martyry. I salute the Rojava revolution. We curse need to be together. If we are not together and united, Erdogan and his like will easily find a way to play us off one another. If Barzani continues to operate with Erdogan, we will no longer recognize him. He needs to understand this well. We must take ownership of our martyr of Rojava and of the four pieces of Kurdistan. Ronayatay is a Kurdish mother who has lost a son in the PKK. Told the reporters that we must embrace their revolution and do everything we can to support our brothers and sisters in Rojava. Ate expressed her emotion through We Kurds are together, the whole of four parts. Until we are united as Kurds, we will never get any result from our rightful claim. Examine your consciences. Let us be united and let us support Rojava. I am calling on Kurdish mothers in particular. Let them not accept it, these operations. I also condemn what Barzani has said about Rojava revolution. It was almost a year ago that Sakine Jansız, a founding member of the Kurdish and Workers' Party, PKK, Fidan Doğan, a spokeswoman for KNK in France, and Leyla Şaylemez, a member of a Kurdish youth movement, were assassinated in the center of Paris, shot in the head. There is no release of official information about the investigation for reasons of confidentiality. However, lawyer Antoine Comte told the ANF that evidence pointed to the Turkish state's responsibility for the murders. The investigation is in progress, said Comte, and added, a lawyer has to respect the confidentiality principle during the investigation, according to French laws. This is the case for all the lawyers regardless of which party they represent. However, I can say that the investigation points to Turkish involvement. The rest of the investigation is up to Turkish cooperation. What can we do to coerce Turkey to help the investigation? A state gives hardly any information about her agents. We can't expect this. In order for the Turkish state to talk not only to the French with whom they already have good relations, but also to Europe as well. The problem has to be recognized as Europe's, said Comte, adding that as the assassinated women were all Europeans, the future of the investigation was of exceptional interest to the whole of Europe. He also noted there was new information concerning whether the chief suspect, Omer Gunay, was under surveillance by French intelligence. Comte stated that the investigation would be completed within a year and underlined that Omer Gunay was a professional and would never openly confess his involvement.